Hey folks, when it comes to biblical interpretation, sometimes we can find ourselves taking a piece of scripture, a verse, or maybe a couple of verses, taking them, looking at them as they are, and making a decision about what they say. Sometimes this is an okay thing to do. I mean, there's lots of proverbs that you can just look at one or two verses and you can get what the author's trying to say pretty clearly. There are other verses where, in the New Testament or in the Old, where you can look at it and you can get an idea of what, the, what it is the author is trying to say. And there's other verses where it's really important that we dive into not only what came before, but what comes after. And even the entirety of the chapter, the book, or the Bible itself in order to find out what's actually taking place in those few words. I thought today we could try a little experiment. I beg your patience. We're going to take a look at John chapter 11. It's that famous story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But we're going to start at that verse. The shortest verse in the entire Bible. Jesus wept. Now, if we were to start here as the only thing about this chapter that we know, Jesus wept. We don't know what comes before. We don't know what comes after. We just know those words, Jesus wept. What can we glean from that? Well, Jesus cried. Jesus mourned. Jesus wasn't afraid of his feelings. Jesus wasn't, uh, wasn't afraid of crying. We could say Jesus wept. He cried all the time. He was always crying. Jesus was always sad. Jesus was always mourning. There's lots we can glean from that, from those two words, some of which are accurate. Jesus comes across as a pretty emotionally aware and healthy individual. But we could also take it in other directions that don't necessarily apply if we were to say Jesus wept. That's all he did. Jesus cried all the time, cried over everything. We can allow our brains to go in another direction. If we take a look at what is going on in this moment, it gives us a better understanding of what's, what these two words may tell us. If we look at what's, where he is, for example, the setting. Well, where is he? Well, he's standing in front of the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And around him are people crying and weeping and mourning. And beside him are Lazarus' sisters. So we could say Jesus was experiencing the loss of his friend and he cried over that. We could say Jesus was experiencing the pain of the people around him and he was crying over that. We could say that Jesus was having compassion and, and he was feeling the grief of these two closer friends, Mary and Martha, over the death of their brother. And out of that compassion he cried. But we also know that Mary and Martha had both been a little bit angry with Jesus just prior to this moment. When they said, Lord, if you had been here, you could have saved him. He wouldn't have died. So coming back to Jesus wept, well, was he weeping over his, the remorse for what he has done or what he didn't do? Did he feel guilty? Did he feel responsible somehow? And he was crying out of, out of, out of that place. Go a little further back in the story. And we know that Jesus was approached days before this. Jesus was approached days before this by somebody saying, Hey, listen, Jesus, your buddy Lazarus, he's sick. He's really sick. He's going to die. You need to get there to save him. And Jesus says, no, 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 we're going to hold off for a few days. There's something else happening here. Jesus was well aware that Lazarus' death was actually part of a bigger picture. Jesus understood that Lazarus' death was going to play a role in the ministry. So we know that he wasn't feeling guilty over Lazarus' death. Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Then why would Jesus be crying standing in front of the tomb of his deceased friend? Was he faking his tears? No. The tears were sincere. The tears were authentic. The pain was real. But what was the source of the pain? 
It could have been the grief of all the people around him. Sure, we get caught up emotionally in what others are feeling. Jesus could have been feeling bad that all these people were feeling sad about Lazarus' death because they didn't know what was about to happen. Maybe he feels responsible for that. But we also know by reading not only later on in this book, but reading the other Gospels, that Jesus is continuously telling us that we are going to have eternal life if we believe in him, that we, will ha- that we will spend eternity in heaven where there is no weeping, where there is no gnashing of teeth, that we will experience our eternity in a place of paradise. However that may appear to us, we also know that after Jesus was arrested and crucified, that the Pharisees made a plan to have Lazarus killed. Because Lazarus, once Jesus brings him back from the dead, was a walking, talking, breathing example of the power that Jesus Christ wielded in the world. And if they were going, to, if the Pharisees were going to kill Lazarus, chances are Mary and Martha weren't safe either. And yet Jesus, in this moment, standing in front of the tomb as he wept, he knew all of these things and he was still going to bring Lazarus from that place of paradise into this dusty world where Lazarus and his family were going to suffer because of this moment. Maybe Jesus was weeping, not because of what had happened. Maybe Jesus was weeping because of what he was about to do to his friend. Maybe he was weeping because he was about to bring him back into a world that pales in comparison to the paradise that Lazarus had been experiencing over these days. Maybe he was weeping because he was about to bring his friend back into a world that was going to turn on him, that was going to require Lazarus to be looking over his shoulder for the rest of his life, wondering when the Pharisees would attack. A world where Lazarus was always going to be anxious and worried about his sisters whom he loved. Scared that the Pharisees may at some point come after them. Jesus was pulling Lazarus from the paradise he was experiencing into a world of turmoil. He wasn't doing Lazarus any favors in this moment. This was going to cost Lazarus. It was going to cost him a lot. And Jesus knew that. Now the reason I offer this isn't just for the theological reflection, but also as a reminder that pieces of scripture, verses, do not usually stand on their own. They are informed by other passages of scripture, by other things that have happened, not only in the books that they're written in, but in the other books of the Bible. They're written not only in the words that the Bible expresses, but the spirit that the Bible offers. Scripture is not linear. It's not even circular. It's spherical. It's three-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. Sometimes the words say something to us, but it's the shadow that the words cast that say something to us. Sometimes it's not just what the words say, sometimes it's what the words don't say that can teach us things. It's easy to use scripture. It's easy to use a verse or two to prove our point. It's incredibly difficult to use a verse or two to prove our point when we are allowing the rest of the book to inform us about those verses. This, I would offer, is the right way of applying scripture to our lives. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face be made to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance be lifted up to you. May you always know the peace of being in the Lord's presence. And I pray that as you open your holy scripture, you would allow it to be informed, not only by what's going on around it, not only by what's happened before it, but by the entirety of the work, by the spirit 
of the work, by the spirit of the word. Amen.